Yo, what is up guys and welcome back to McAdies Entertainment. I'm your host as always, Adam McGahey. Got another full comic movie for you guys and this time it's going to be on the time where our boy Spider-Man entered the Bloodborne universe. Well, not exactly the universe from the iconic, disturbing, and rather infuriating PlayStation video game franchise. The aesthetic for this comic is pretty darn close and honestly gives Marvel a whole other excuse to torture Peter Parker for no apparent reason. This whole story actually comes from the pages of the 2023 run of Spine Tingling Spider-Man, so as always, be sure to support the official release. It's always much better to go to a comic store, buy a comic, and physically read it in your hands than rather have some guy like me yap about it on YouTube. Before we hop into that though, as always, I wanted to let you guys know that our superhero training program is live. Physical and mental health are very important for my family and I, so we've gone ahead and crafted our own superhero training program. I have my own app where I'll be able to provide you with one-on-one -on -one online training and help get you in shape like your favorite superhero from DC and Marvel comic movies. I'm offering free consultations, so if this is of interest, you can check that out in the link below. With that out of the way though, let's get on with what you came here for, and that would be the time when Spider-Man entered the Bloodborne universe. The issue opens where we see Spider-Man combating his monstrous demonic clone Spider-Side above the New York rooftops. Finally knocking the hulking brute to the ground, the demon claimed that this battle was not over, only for Peter to web his mouth shut and proceeded to knock his self-proclaimed brother unconscious. As the authorities brought the bean into custody, Spidey then swung away, reflecting on his life. Despite all the horrible things that had happened to him over the years, Peter reminded himself on how blessed he truly was and that people appreciated his work as a hero. Coming back to his apartment, Peter got ready for bed to finally catch up on some rest after his day-long battle. The next morning, Peter's senses awoke him to the mysterious sound of voices all around him. These voices just so happened to be New York City police officers who had their guns drawn on the man, telling him to get up. Asking just what the heck was going on, the officers told him to freeze and put his hands in the air. Complying with the officers, Peter raised his arms and asked just what he did for them to barge into his apartment with their weapons drawn. Just then, Peter's supposed landlord Oswaldo arrived, informed the officers that he had no idea who Peter was and demanded for him to leave. Completely confused, Peter went to show proof that he lived here, only to realize that all of his belongings had up and vanished. Giving Peter one final chance to leave peacefully, the wall crawler sadly obliged and made his way outside. Having no idea what was happening, Peter turned to the one person that he could confide in during times like these, and that would be his Aunt May. However, not even she could save him this time, for she had no idea who this complete stranger was calling her, and basically thought Peter was a telemarketer, who she told to get lost. Horrified at this occurrence, Peter then turned to Mary Jane, who he called repeatedly, only for her not to answer. He then booked it over to her apartment where he found her, only for her to also be under this supposed spell, where she didn't know who Peter was and presumed that he was some sort of stalker. MJ then called for help, where Peter soon found himself surrounded by an angry mob of real-life Twitter warriors. Knowing not even he stood a chance against a group that powerful, he then ran where he came across a construction site. Seeing this as the perfect spot to lay low, he went to climb down the giant pit, only for his hands not to stick to the wall, where he then plummeted to the pit's depths, badly hurting his back. It was here a shocked and frightened Peter then realized that not only did his family not recognize him, he also did not have his powers. He then tried one last ditch effort to call the Avengers using his private line, only to get an automated message saying it did not exist. Seeing that he was completely alone in this dark world, Peter then received a series of strange text messages asking him if he wanted his life back. 
He was then followed by several more messages telling him to meet at track 31 of Grand Central Station at midnight. Alone and powerless, Peter had no choice but to obey the words of this mysterious stranger. Arriving at the mysterious track 31, Peter boarded the abandoned train car where he was soon met by a voice behind him. It was here that he was met by a disgusting and disturbing sight which was the train's conductor, who had a gaunt pale face, a twisted long drooling smile, and most horrifying of all, sunken in crimson eyes with blood falling down his cheeks. The crooked conductor then asked the frightened Peter for his ticket, where he told him that he did not have one. Not pleased at this response, the man's already twisted body contorted even further, where he then summoned a hammer and went to collect the fare by brutally attacking Peter with it. Having no abilities or spider sense to help him, Spider-Man relied on nothing but pure intuition and adrenaline to keep himself alive as he evaded this pursuer. Heading further and further into the hellish train car, Peter finally stumbled across some um, guests where he told them that they all needed to leave for there was something wrong with the train's conductor. It is here that we see the patrons show themselves as hideous boar-like human hybrids covered in blood who expressed their delight at how delicious a main course Peter looked, revealing that this whole time they had been dining on human flesh. Completely disgusted, horrified, and confused, Peter once again fled to another car and slammed the door behind him. Peering into the window of unending darkness, Spider-Man tried to catch a glimpse of where this train was headed, only to soon be met by a familiar, horrifying pair of glowing eyes. Once again being attacked by the corpse-like conductor, Peter continued to run from the stalker, all while the other patrons looked on with twisted smiles of delight, warning him not to be caught. The next issue opens, where we see the powerless Spider-Man desperately attempt to flee the clutches of the train's conductor, who is hell-bent on making the man pay for not having his ticket. In sheer desperation, Peter jumped from one car to the next and slammed the door behind him to gain some time. Saying that he was safe, at least for now, Peter was soon met by another voice behind him, except this time it was not another monster out to get him, it was a little girl named TJ, who also appeared to be a prisoner of this twisted train to hell. Comforting the child, Peter asked how she got here, where she said she could not quite remember, but was relieved to have an adult by her side, for she knew the way out and now had the confidence to escape. Making their way to the back of another car, TJ led Peter to a hatch which would lead underneath the train. Without his powers, Peter struggled to lift the heavy hatch, but soon succeeded, with TJ excitedly telling him that this was the way out. The concerned Spider-Man then told the girl that there was no way they could jump down, for the train was still in motion, and they would be easily crushed. Before he could even finish his sentence, Peter looked on in horror, as TJ leapt down the hole, where he witnessed the young girl get swept away on the tracks below. Traumatized at what he just saw, Peter knew he had to find a way out. Finding his way to the freezer car, he thought perhaps there could be an exit through here, only for the horrors to continue, as he saw countless mutilated bodies of the train victims, all hung on flesh hooks as some sort of bizarre trophy of those who did not pay their fare. Before he could even process what he was seeing, Peter once again heard the infamous stomps of the conductor, who had returned to collect. Knowing he had to make one final stand, Peter saw an ice pick jabbed into one of the hanging legs, and then waited for the zombie man to open the door, where he then let out a savage cry, and plunged the weapon right through the demon's eye. Despite his best efforts, the attack would not even phase the creature, who once again repeated the phrase that he needed a ticket for the train, 
where he then instantly pulled the pick out, revealing his pus oozing wound underneath. Even though he no longer had the strength, Peter finally had enough and posed up to throw hands with the monster, where suddenly the train stopped, causing both men to lose their balance. Taking immediate advantage of this time, Peter burst through the door of the car and was able to find an opening to the outside where he leapt into the dark and rainy streets of an unknown town. Having no clue if he was still being followed, Peter fled the train, where we then see a mysterious manner in the not so far distance. On his trek, Spider-Man then came across a disturbing sight in the muddied ground. Photos, a series of his friends such as J. Jonah Jameson, Mary Jane, and Aunt May, all seemingly being caged and tortured. Wondering just where his loved ones could be, Peter immediately knew the answer as he followed the trail of pictures which led to the demented looking house from Hades. Thinking back to when he had his powers, Peter reflected that he used to feel brave, but in this situation, he was quickly forgetting what bravery felt like. Summoning all the courage he could, Spider-Man's fear only amplified at the interior of the house, which had blood and bone strewn everywhere. Sensing that this house was alive and could feel his fear, Peter soon heard a voice calling out for help. Instantly springing into action, the hero went to aid, only for his mad dash to quickly be interrupted by shards of broken glass all over the floor, which tore into the soles of his feet. Without spider abilities to help heal from an injury like this, Peter had to suck up the pain and journey to help the tortured soul, leaving a trail of bloodied footprints all over the mansion floor. Finding the source of the sound, Peter was shocked to discover what it was. His former boss, J. Jonah Jameson, battered, bruised, and hung from the ceiling with a series of chains from a medieval-looking contraption. Helping the man down, Spider-Man went to get him out, only for Jonah to reveal that there were two more victims upstairs who he was forced to hear scream for hours. Recognizing these voices immediately, Peter flew upstairs, where he discovered Aunt May and Mary Jane, two were victims of this devilish game. Telling his family he was here to help, Peter calmed the women down and vowed that he would get them out of here. Instructing the trio to follow his lead, he immediately saw not all was as it seemed, as the people's bodies twisted and contorted with their eyes glowing, telling the young man in mocking demonic voices that they would follow him to the ends of the earth. The next chapter opens as we see the horrified and powerless Peter Parker flee from the seemingly demon-possessed Mary Jane, Aunt May, and J. Jonah Jameson as they relentlessly chase him in this house of horrors. As Parker rushed down the stairs, he suddenly had a moment of clarity in the midst of his fear. Despite not having his powers, Something about these supposed family members seemed too familiar. The synchronized movements, the consistency around their voices. These were not people, they were machines. Seeing that things were finally coming together, Peter finally realized who was behind these last horrifying days, and that was his longtime enemy, the master of illusions, Mysterio. Knowing he was no match for these androids without his spider strength, Peter still had his superior intellect and knew that Mysterio could never quite compute human-like equilibrium on his creations. Therefore, the quick-thinking hero kicked out the railing to the stairs, causing the machines to plummet to the first floor below, breaking their synthetic necks. Disturbed while looking on at the lifelike corpses of his loved ones, Peter pressed on to find Mysterio and finally end this nightmare once and for all. 
Expecting to find his old foe in a typical supervillain lair, we would see things were much more unsettling, as we see the real Quentin Beck, eyes bloodshot and restrained to a wall, with syringes piercing his skull, all while muttering Peter's name. Confused if he should be fighting or rescuing his enemy, Peter felt sympathy on the man as he realized that Mysterio too was part of a greater power's twisted game. Helping the man down, Quentin, finally having a semblance of free will return, was relieved to see Peter and immediately warned the man that he must leave this place. Asking where they even truly were, we see Beck reveal the truth. All of this that Peter had experienced, the apartment, the encounter on the streets, the subway, this house, it was all elaborate sets and props that Mysterio was forced to make by a darker higher force. Seeing that Quentin was not in his right mind, Peter didn't necessarily believe this, as yes, Mysterio was quite talented at what he did, but was not this good to create something this detailed. Agreeing to this artistic critique, Beck told him that whatever kind of drugs that had been pumped into his brain caused his entire body to go into overload and was able to achieve things on a near supernatural level, which resulted in this hell that they had both experienced. Not having the time to connect all the red tape, Peter told Quentin that they were getting out of this place, much to the relief of the horrified supervillain. Making their way through a hall, Mysterio screamed for them to duck, where they were nearly decapitated from a giant axe contraption that swung in their direction. With Mysterio recognizing this trap as his own creation, Peter was thankful to his old enemy, given that his spider sense was gone, and if it were not for him, they surely would have perished. Seeing that there was a light in the darkness of this nightmare, Mysterio revealed to Peter that there was a Spider-Man costume waiting for him, and despite not having his abilities, he could still be a hero. With his signature smile, Peter donned the iconic red and blue, filled with confidence to lead them out of this hell. Making their way outside into the rain-drenched woods, Spider-Man promised Mysterio he would get him help and medical attention that he needed, where they were then met by a group of malevolent voices. These voices belonged to a rather terrifying group of hunters, donning bizarre animal-like masks, welcoming their prey to their great hunt. Despite wearing his suit, Peter was still no different than a mortal man, and had no spider sense to aid him as the hunters opened fire on the pair as they dived deeper and deeper into the dark forest. Encountering a hunter donning a demonic looking ram's mask, Spider-Man faced the man head on, telling Beck to get behind him. Knowing that these wicked people were fueling on his fear, the quick thinking Peter faced things head on and pulled up his mask, where he took an unorthodox page out of his Zombieverse variant's book and bit the man right on the cheek. As the blood poured from his mouth, Peter saw that his confidence inspired Quentin as well, for the man saved his ally by beating one of the hunters who attempted to get the jump on them with a rock. Honestly, I don't think I've ever seen Mysterio fight with his bare hands, let alone with a rock, and it's absolutely fantastic to see. As the men went to make their getaway, Spider-Man tripped over what he thought may have just been a branch when in reality, it was so much more. This was actually an electric cable, which led to the entire movie set that Mysterio had forcibly constructed. The apartment, the subway, everything was just as he said, all one big elaborate mental game to ruin Peter's life. Asking just how this was possible and how he didn't realize things sooner, Mysterio revealed that the mastermind behind this had been using drugs to get into Peter's mind, 
being able to make him see, feel, touch, taste, smell, and sense whatever he wanted, making them prisoners in a reality of his own making. Infuriated, Peter demanded Quentin to reveal who this mastermind was, but the horrified villain could not, in fear that he may be killed. Before he could talk, Mysterio suddenly collapsed to the ground, where Peter was met by yet another voice, this one telling him he had the answers that he was seeking. This voice we see belonged to the hulking demonic clone of his, Spiderside, the monster whom Peter thought he had beaten and imprisoned days earlier. Thinking that he was the one behind this, Spider-Man lunged at the brute only to be effortlessly caught by the clone who told him that he could easily crush him and that if he wished to live, he must listen to what he had to say. Revealing that they were in a blind spot of the Mastermind's cameras, Spider-Side told Peter that what Mysterio said was true. The person behind this had access to high-tech weaponry and tools that altered Peter's mind and even his powers, making him believe that they were lost. He went on to tell Spider-Man that this was all a trap, months, potentially even years in the making, and that he too was a prisoner in this vast game. Asking just who could be behind this, we see Spider-Side reveal the answer that we had all been waiting for. This mastermind, the one behind everything, including Spider-Side's creation, was the demented geneticist, thought long gone, the man even behind Ben Riley's creation, the scientist Miles Warren, aka the Jackal. The final issue opens where Spider-Man is confronted by his beastly clone Spider-Side, who had revealed to him that the man responsible for their days of torment was the crazed geneticist Miles Warren. Telling Peter that the unconscious Mysterio too was an unwilling participant in this game, we see that the clone had endured months of torture, where the scientist had pumped all sorts of drugs and chemicals into his brain to make him his puppet. Putting his differences with Spider-Man aside for the time being, he brought out a mysterious remote-like device. He then informs Peter that Warren had injected a chip into his brain which inhibited his powers, making him believe that they were gone. With this remote, he was able to deactivate the implant, allowing his abilities to return. Before Spider-Man could celebrate the return of his strength, Miles would become alert to what was going on and activated a trap within Spider-Side's body, causing an enormous wave of electricity to tear through him, knocking the brute unconscious. Fueled with his power in an unrelenting rage for what happened to him this past week, Peter spilled his wrath upon the Jackal's henchmen. Having no need to hold back, as they were androids, displaying just a fraction of how strong Spider-Man truly was. Making his way inside the Mad Doctor's lab, the wall crawler swore he would find him, where we see that he had played right into the man's hands, where we see the Jackal, seated upon his self-made throne, overlooking a bloodied operating table. Asking the hero if he was afraid, we see Peter is rushed by a sudden flood of memories. This was his blood. This was all where the horrible experiments that happened to him occurred. Everything that Spider-Side and Mysterio said was true, and the demon responsible was staring him right in the face. With the hero momentarily overtaken by the PTSD of this event, the Jackal grinned proclaiming this was exactly what he needed. For the greatest prison he could trap Spider-Man in was not one made of walls and shackles, but a boundless one made of pure, concentrated fear. Before he could get his hands on Peter, an awakened Mysterio burst in, demanding for Spider-Man to snap out of it 
and finally put a stop to this madness. Empowered by his former enemy's words, Spider-Man calmly approached the Jackal and proceeded to beat his demented jailer within an inch of his life. With the doctor barely clinging onto consciousness, Peter told him that he had failed. Saying that he was done fighting, the wounded Jackal bared a blood-soaked smile, telling him that while he may have been beaten physically, he was far from failure in his mission and had in fact succeeded. With a crazed yet determined glare, Miles told Peter that what he did to him these past few days would fester in his mind, his body, and his soul for years, and that when he wakes up in a cold sweat at night, it would be because of him. Infuriated, Spider-Man told the man to shut up, who of course continued monologuing, only for the wall crawler to press the skip cutscene button by completely shattering his jaw. With the monster finally defeated, Peter took off his mask as he looked over the unconscious body of his foe, questioning what he just did, and began to ponder if the jackal was right and had won in the end. Approached by the wounded Mysterio, the men exchanged nods as Peter watched the former villain walk away in hopes of starting a new life and attempt to recover from the hell he had been through these past months. Coming back to where Spider-Side was knocked out, Peter would see that the clone had awoken and escaped, knowing that he would return to kill him sometime in the future. Shrugging that off as it was a fight for another day, Peter tied the unconscious Miles to a street pole for the authorities, declaring that there was one last thing he must do before he could even pretend that he was normal again. The very next morning, Peter called his Aunt May, hoping that if he was truly awake from this nightmare, that she would remember who he was. Much to his joy, unlike the Aunt May from the beginning of this tale, this one did remember her nephew, and asked why he was calling her so early, and was quite insulted thinking that she would not remember him, saying that she was not that old just yet. Also checking on the likes of Mary Jane and Jonah Jameson, Peter was very relieved to see that these were indeed his loved ones. They were safe, and all was as it should be. Believing that things were back to normal, Peter went from being a spine-tingling Spider-Man, back to a friendly neighborhood one, as he swung through the sunny streets of New York once again. Seeing that reality was back to being reality, we are greeted to one final panel, where the hero sees his reflection in a nearby skyscraper, only to see the reflection of the jackal staring back at him. And that is the full story of Spine Tingling Spider-Man. I hope you guys enjoyed this, for I certainly enjoyed reading it and putting these videos together for you guys to enjoy. This was definitely one of the more original, entertaining, and darker Spider-Man stories that I have read, and was reminiscent of tales like Craven's Last Hunt. I definitely think there is room for darker stories like this in the MCU, and I hope the franchise can grow up a bit and deliver more mature content like this featuring iconic IPs like Spider-Man, whether that be in live action or even animation. I mean, hey, X-Men is back with X-Men 97, so here's to hoping the Spider-Man 90s animated series gets a revival too. A proper Jackal clone saga arc in 90s animated cartoon style would be the stuff of dreams. More than anything, I want to know what you think. Did you read the Spider-Man story? Did you enjoy it? What other characters or topics should we cover? Sound off in the comments. Also be sure to give this video a like if you enjoyed today's content, subscribe to the channel, and tap the bell icon to be notified of all of our latest videos. Also, if interested in our superhero training program, you can check out the link to that in the description and the link in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. Remember you are awesome and loved, God bless, and I will see you in the next one.